Um, okay, thank you very much. We now um, come to the uh, item number 11, the Building System Legislative Review Discussion Paper. Uh, and uh, I welcome to the, uh, the table uh, Andrew Minturn and is in, you're on your own, Andrew, yep. But, uh, uh, I am sure. your worship. Yeah. Um, I again will uh, move this uh, pro forma, seconded by uh, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. And if you could report briefly to us on it, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, uh, Morena, um, uh, your worship and councillors, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Uh, hopefully I'll be brief. Uh, the Building System Legislative Reform is a consultation paper put out by the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. Uh, it's probably the first substantial uh, recommendations of change to the Building Act since about 2004. Um, there are a number of areas which directly affect um, the way that we as a council and us as a building consent authority operate, uh, and there are a number of items which are of particular interest to the council in general, uh, primarily of obviously the aspect of um, the liability. Uh, so very, very quickly, um, without, without uh, holding up you too much, the proposals um, are based around some, some basic concepts. First of all, which is the roles and responsibilities of practitioners within the sector. Um, that is talking about licensed building practitioners, the people who undertake the uh, design and the construction, um, and about strengthening that particular framework. And there's a degree in there called a licensed building practitioner. Uh, we um, basically have said that we support the licensed building practitioner regime expanding. Uh, that means putting more uh, onus on the numbers of licensed building practitioners and the areas of professionalism. Um, we also agree that uh, that should be lifted in terms of their skills and competencies. I think we all agree that uh, having quality consent applications and quality buildings being constructed is of a vital importance to us as a community and as a country as a whole. Um, one of the other areas in that is defining what a building product is. Uh, at the moment, uh, we deal with uh, products as, as, a, as a single item, uh, but there is a proposal to talk about uh, an entire building being a product. Uh, and if you've looked at a building, that's, it's got a lot of hundreds, if not thousands, of things in it. Uh, so we would like that definition explained uh, and also to give us some confidence that when we are talking about products, we are talking about a, a whole group of products in a building that must meet the building code. Um, the other part of that is, finally, the acceptance of products is, at the moment, uh, the responsibility of the BCA, i.e. the council. Um, we see that as a very unfair position. Uh, the proposal is to create a, a, a more robust system for products. Um, but it stops short of actually having an independent body, a crown entity of some kind, being the register of all products for New Zealand. Uh, so as it stands at the moment, if an application for a building sink comes in, uh, we as the BCA, the council, if it uh, is proposed that a new product is being used, we must assess that. Uh, the last time I looked, I didn't think that we were either a laboratory or an engineering firm, uh, and so we don't really have the skills and competence to do so, but the current legislation puts the onus on us to make that decision. Uh, so we have strongly gone back to uh, government and suggested, uh, and again, most of these recommendations are nothing new to the council. We have been um, talking about these for some time uh, uh, to produce a national register of products which the building construction design industry can um, obviously use. And from the council's perspective, we very quickly can look on that register and make a very quick decision. Uh, that then poses the, uh, the position that we can speed the process of the building consent up. So that's a little bit about products and methods. Uh, occupational regulation, really this talks about the, the engineers um, and there's a proposal to have a separate uh, engineering um, uh, system uh, whereby they are, they are licensed for certain parts of work, which are critical work. Uh, again, in essence, we don't disagree with the proposals on terms of making um, it very clear about uh, where engineering skills and competencies lie. Uh, we don't agree that setting up a new body is the way to go. Uh, we, uh, we agree that um, if uh, legislation was put in place and given the requirements to the current engineering body, which is Engineering New Zealand, and had MB as a, an oversight for that, 
uh, had um, obviously some kind of auditing regime that you couldn't get uh, a, a very good system uh, with without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if I can use that term. Um, we also say that um, this should be mandatory as opposed to voluntary. Many of the positions that the MB has put forward uh, are voluntary. Uh, if the BCAs are to reduce the amount of oversight and to speed uh, the consenting process up, uh, we uh, very much agree that they should be mandatory scenarios. Uh, voluntary puts us in a position of who's in versus who's out, uh, and it doesn't allow us to, to uh, lessen the attention that we put onto a building consent. Risk and liability, uh, this is probably the big one for the council. Um, you uh, have all been aware over many, many years of the liability system that the council falls in under joint and several liability, i.e. the last man standing. Uh, for some time, the consultation has been around that um, council's liability should be capped. Uh, and the proposal that's been banded around for some time is, is around 20%. That 20% has really been um, come about as a result of evidence out of the courts, the amount of uh, money effectively that councils have been found to be actually liable is somewhere between 15 and 20%. Um, as you're aware that when it gets into the situation where a lot of the companies are no longer there to support that on joint several, we as a council are the last man standing and it's therefore in many cases, it's far greater than 20%. It can be up to 100%. Uh, so we have strongly gone back to MB uh, that we propose uh, in the first instance that they move from joint and several liability to proportional liability. Um, there has been significant discussion on that over the years. If that is not successful, the next um, best option is to cap the liability for councils at 20%. Um, those are the two options that we've gone back in terms of risk of liability. Uh, the building levy, uh, really this is a, a mechanism by which uh, councils act as an administrator to collect monies uh, for each of the building consents, which is passed on to MB to be spent for the benefit of the building construction sector. Um, two proposals here. First is to reduce the amount of levy, um, and the second is to expand the powers of the chief executive of the MB to use that money. Uh, currently, there's $43 million sitting in um, some kind of bank account down in Wellington, which the Chief Executive effectively is unable to use um, on areas of training, product certification, guidance material, research, because the powers of the Chief Executive are incredibly narrow. Uh, what we have proposed, uh, and we agree with the proposals from MB, is to expand those um, uh, those uh, abilities of the Chief Executive. What is missing is to what extent they're proposing. Uh, we also do not agree in reducing the levy will have a benefit effect for us as a construction sector because if we reduce the amount of money, it reduces the amount of money that we can also use as part of that research funding moving forward. Uh, so we agree to um, expand the use, and but we disagree to reduce the amount of money that's collected. Uh, Offences and penalties. Um, again, we agree uh, in, the, in the main with what uh, the uh, proposals are, which is increasing the maximum penalties proposed for um, people uh, and organisations who um, have acted inappropriately within the construction sector. This brings us in alignment with the Health and Safety Workers Act 2015. Uh, we also support extending the time frame from which a council or other organisations can lay charges from six months to 12 months. And we also um, support the changes in terms of how these things are notified. Uh, as you'd appreciate, the old Gazette system was the, the normal way of, of notifying. Uh, technology has moved on significantly, and so MB is supporting that there are other electronic means to notify these sorts of charges and penalties, and we fundamentally agree. And lastly, um, there are a number of proposals that the council is making which are not part of the submission, uh, but we believe are in the best interest of the Building Act moving forward. Um, firstly, the statutory days. As you'd appreciate, we have a statutory obligation to process all building consents, irrespective of it's a doghouse or a hospital, within 20 working days. Uh, that is, uh, quite frankly, not, not workable, and particularly in today's scenarios where the complexity of the building has increased significantly over the last decade or so. Uh, so we are proposing, similar to other jurisdictions around the world, a, a, a more diverse uh, and staggered approach to those statutory days, which would reflect the types of complexities of the buildings which are being supported. 
Uh, another one we're there is um, licensed building practitioners. At the moment, licensed building practitioners uh, enter the market um, on a fairly low uh, level of experience and uh, able to demonstrate competence. Uh, what we have suggested, again, similar to other jurisdictions, is some kind of standard exam or test that puts them all on a living playing field to start with. And, and this is a building code test of some kind. And the last proposal which we have here is um, a universal design for the design industry. And again, I understand that the, that the councils support that. Uh, so those are the proposals that we have. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Andrew. First question in the name of Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Your Worship. And Andrew, you've done a great job, very clear, and thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, have you mooted any of these suggestions with any other councils? And my second question is, and what happens next? Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, I've had two fairly large consultations with um, most of the councils in New Zealand. Uh, in fact, yesterday, no, not yesterday, the day before, I was in Wellington at the Ministry where at least 40 to 50 representatives of other councils participated in a workshop with MB to discuss these very factors. So supplementary, so you're pretty confident that what we're saying is sort of shared nationwide, give or take? I'm very confident that what we're suggesting is exactly the same um, mechanisms that everybody else is de demonstrating. Fantastic, thank you. And then my, what happens next is, so this goes down to Wellington, how long will they take to think about it and when can we actually see some action? Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, <laughs> having spent 15 years in central government myself, uh, that is a very long piece of string. Um, there is a, this is the first of a series of consultation processes that take place, um, and I imagine that there's going to be some robust discussion coming back from the sector, and it is, I'll make it clear here, it's not just the BCAs that are making these comments. Uh, the construction sector, the design sector, the, the um, product sector have some significant feedback to the government on this space. Um, they have proposed that uh, they're likely to go to a bill before the end of the year. Um, again, that has a series of internal processes, select committees and the likes. I don't suspect that we will see anything um, probably until I would suggest mid-2020. If the robustness of the conversations are such that they have to rethink some of those issues, then um, yes, it probably 2020 before we see something concrete. I think it's worth mentioning, Councillor, that we put these proposals in front of the Merrill Housing Task Force with the um, cross-section of uh, uh, housing and, and construction in interests that are reflected there. These are consistent broadly with the Task Force report and will be supported broadly, but there will be a, a parallel but separate um, submission coming from the Merrill Housing Task Force. So, uh, And when do we want it? Uh, now, as they say in the demonstrations. That was my point, but I just wanted to get reality check on that too, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Newman. Good morning and thank you for a very good report. Uh, with respect to the Part 4 risk and liability, do you have any information about incidents of companies subject to joint and several liability which um, have subsequently effectively gone out of existence, thus absolving themselves from, from that liability? Um, thank you, Councillor. In, in terms of the conversations and the discussions around um, moving from a joint and several liability to a proportional liability, I think that's what you're asking. Um, uh, I haven't had any details as to where that's at, um, hence the reason why we're putting two parts to our submission in. One uh, is obviously we, local government New Zealand, um, and, and I mean local government New Zealand as well as all our councils, uh, still support uh, pushing for um, proportional liability within the construction sector. Uh, the, uh, the report that came back from um, the, the Crown Law that, that did the investigations uh, was making suggestions that, yes, they recognised that the construction sector had some difficulties and challenges within um, our industry. Uh, shelf companies is a classic example where companies create a business, uh, do a, a large-scale development, and then the day after they've uh, got their certificate, they close those shelf companies down. Uh, we have also proposed within our recommendations that they should be looking at that particular piece of legislation to prevent companies from doing so in that space. Um, 
uh, we are realists at the end of the day, and uh, the Crown Law made it very clear um, why would we want to change the entire legal system when really you're the only industry that has a bit of a problem in it. So uh, hence we, we still push that particular point, but we're, but we're also suggesting that the cap of 20% liability is a far more practical way of dealing with it, and you can do so within the Building Act itself. Follow up if I may. Um, I haven't read the discussion documents, but your report is very um, thorough. But can you just outline, in the context of a very, very small market like New Zealand, um, where one would find an insurance product as proposed here? Because it, to me, this just doesn't seem like an attractive option for somebody to provide that product um, as a means of, of guarantee for new builds and significant alterations, given what I think is is the lack of ability to retain operators in the market for the purpose of ensuring that they hold liability in a joint and several model. So um, where do we get those products? Uh, thank you again, Councillor. Um, yes, you're absolutely right that um, unfortunately due to uh, past issues associated with our, with our industry, um, there's a reticence in terms of insurance agencies to act in that space. However, uh, anecdotally, the conversations that we and MB have had with the insurance industry said that there is a definitely a market there. Uh, what we say is that, um, and again, anecdotally from insurance agencies, really it is a volume-driven industry. Uh, you can only work that if they're all in. The problem with the proposals, uh, and apologies for not mentioning this during my initial um, discussion, was that the proposal for the mandatory war or the warranty insurance schemes for residential houses is effectively just that. It is a voluntary scheme with an opt-out clause. Um, again, that puts council in a very difficult position that if you've got people who are uh, having to pay 5-10% on top of their houses for a warranty scheme and they're stretched for their limits at that stage, it's probably going to be the first thing they drop off. So your likelihood is that if it's a voluntary scheme, uh, a, a significant proportion of people are not going to opt for the warranty system. That then doesn't help us as a council because if we have X amount of people who do have a warranty scheme and X amount that don't, um, we are probably unlikely to change the way we operate in terms of our risk averseness because we don't have that backup in that space. So in order for our 20% cap liability to work effectively, we need to have all the other systems which MB have proposed, which are many insurance schemes in their own right to proportionalise the risk that we as a council and the BCA face to those other parts of the, the industry. Um, and because that's all voluntary at this stage, uh, that makes it challenging for us. Thank you. It's just worth mentioning, Councillor, that at the uh, Merrill Housing Task Force meeting, the insurance representative there made exactly those points, uh, that it is volume driven. If you make it voluntary, um, one, you'll, you'll let the worst culprits escape because they'll put pressure on it for it to be voluntary, but there may not be the volume for the insurance industry to, to be involved. And that's why our submission needs to say that warranty insurance coverage ought to be mandatory. Um, Councillor Casey. Oh, it is, a comment. it is a question. It will be a question. Just to say thank you, Andrew. I took advantage of the one-on-one -on -one with you and I just want to endorse what other councillors have said with regard to street talking. No fluff and no weasel words. I really appreciate that. You also write the way you speak, which is uh, a joy. My question, though, <laughs> my question relates to the last item that you just really skipped over, and that was accessible universal design. Um, half the council went to the Community Development and Safety Committee recently, where we spent three hours with the Disability Advisory Panel on accessibility. And there's no question that we're not doing it right. Hobsonville Point came up. As a, as a classic case in point, we are, we are building new houses that are inaccessible, and that's just not fair. So I, I would like you just to say, and we also had uh, Paula Tesorero, who's the Human Rights, uh, the Disability Rights Commissioner, come and talk on this subject, and that's a topic very dear to her heart. The upshot is that what you skipped over at the end demands a bit more airtime right now. So I'd like you to tell the councillors what it means if we introduce universal design for new housing. 
Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, my apologies for skipping over it. I didn't mean that in any way. It is a, it is a submission which is a, 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 almost an addendum to the proposals. The reason being is that the consultation document doesn't cover universal design as an aspect itself. Uh, so we must answer the questions uh, which are in the submission document as they propose to us, and then we have the ability to add extra material in behind. Um, so we are putting in a, a significant paper for universal design, um, and our universal design office, in fact, I'm in the back here, if you want to ask some specific questions, we have Fiona um, is with me in that space. Uh, so yes, we're taking it very seriously. Um, there is significant information that you may like to get directly from Fiona if you'd like to ask those questions. The Derby. Oh, sorry. You're yeah, we're just about to hear. <laughs> Invitation to ask questions. <laughs> um, uh, through you, uh, Your Worship. Um, thanks, Councillor Casey. Yes, we have put um, a addendum to Andrew's comprehensive Brilliant. report, and uh, it will it is uh, requiring that the Ministry open the scope of the um, investigation to include universal design. At the moment, we're suggesting changes to... Um, to the principle of the Act and then changes to two other sections and we'll work with the Ministry to look at the New Zealand standards and the building code when that consequently happens. Supplementary, do we get to go speak to the submission or is it just you submit and that's it, they read it and then they decide? Um, uh, thank you Councillor. Uh, yes. There is, there's always that option. So what will happen is MB are gathering the uh, submission material and, and we have to have this in um, by the 15th, I think it is, of, of June. It's a very tight time frame for the submission proposals. Uh, we have had um, two days with the MB, the last two days, a colleague of mine, Peter and I, have been down in Wellington discussing these uh, with MB itself, um, and we were very clear about where the council's position was, uh, where it supported the proposals put forward, and, and where we have some uh, differences of opinion in that space. Uh, but moving forward, as, as I said, I, I don't think that this is going to be a clear tick-the-box exercise from the Ministry's perspective. There is significant feedback from a variety of different sectors who are in agreement in principle, but disagreement in the uh, lack of information within the proposal, which demonstrates how you're going to articulate and how you're going to put into practice what you're suggesting. So uh, I would, uh, having been involved in this many times before, my during sector consultation on behalf of the MB or the, the Department of Building and Housing, that that is definitely a position that we should be put into. Thank you. Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Chair, I had to leave your mural housing task force the other day when this item was about to come up so I should have raised it there but I couldn't be there so apologies I'll need to raise it now just clarification on um, and some very good submission points there thank you very much uh, on the building research levy is that the levy that's referred to in the legislation uh, Councillor, no, that the, there are two levies that are, that are um, administered um, or collected by the Building Consent Authority. One is the Brands Levy, which effectively goes straight through the Building Research Association New Zealand. And the second one is an MB Levy, that is a central government levy for the construction industry. And that is the levy that we are talking about. Unfortunately, that levy is collected, put into um, a very dark bank account down in Wellington and can't be effectively used. So there's $43 million worth of money that we've collected as a sector over many years and it's not being used effectively. And MB recognise that. Um, and they need to change the legislation to allow the, the chief executive of the powers to use it in a, in a far wider, and they term uh, stewardship, which of the industry. And we want to know what does stewardship actually mean. Okay, so have we also looked at the, that brands levy? This is 60-year-old legislation, and it talks about it being collected by builders, and it assumes that the builder is a male. It's, it's archaic. Um, and that also, the, the tasks that are identified there, there's about 14 different categories. Have we looked at that and whether brands and the legislation that supports brands is actually fit for purpose? Uh, Councillor, not, not during this uh, particular proposal. It wasn't part of the um, proposal um, document requirements or the areas of expertise or even within the scope of this particular element. Um, we have broadened... I, I guess in the supplementary part to this proposal, um, seeking some options 
moving forward in terms of what MB could do. Um, and uh, yes, you are quite correct in the fact that the two ways that the levies are collected at the moment uh, have been around for an extremely long period of time. The construction sector isn't just the construction sector, it is the design sector, the product manufacturing sector, the BCAs, um, and they all participate in the sector, uh, but they don't all participate in providing some kind of levy that's being used universally for the benefit of the construction design sector. So one of the proposals is to look at potentially, rather than those, uh, those levies, is a levy on the entire industry, so that it's a bit like an ACC level to some extent, which would be a ring fence for the construct design and construction sector. Um, it is a, it is just that as a proposal for them to think about uh, an alternative to the current mechanisms to collect in those money. Um, that I think, um, having been an MB in the last two days, has stimulated a little bit of thought. Uh, so, uh, if I can use the term, I think there's a chink in the armour uh, for what has been proposed. Um, in these, these proposals um, tends to be almost a fader complete. They, they put these forward, if, uh, and the sceptic in me, but having uh, these discussions with them over the last two days, uh, I felt that they've really taken on board uh, the comments from ourselves and from the other BCAs around the country, and they are thinking, mm, actually, there are some different ways of doing things. So, I, personally, I'd watch this space, I guess. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Oh, thank you. Very interesting. You um, you did say I'm pretty sure you said that in 2004. That was when a lot of the recommendation, a lot of changes happened in 2004. And, and did that come from the um, the Audit New Zealand report for Manukau City Council? Um, you're probably aware of it in the Montgomery Watson. Um, you might not be aware, but I, I actually initiated that. It was a, like a five year of, of gathering information and. Uh, I think this council here and other councils around the country really need to have a look at that, that audit New Zealand report and the Montgomery Watson report because um, they did have 55 recommendations for the building consent and resource consent and I think there's a lot of things that we're still not doing that are quite right so, um, so you're quite aware of that document. Um. I'm not aware of that document, but I am exactly aware of how the 2004 Act came about. I was actually part of the group that put some of it together. Right. Uh, you were not Henry Watson. So the, the 2004 Act was um, arguably a knee-jerk reaction to the leaky building syndrome. Um, and so out of the Hun report that produced, there were a number of recommendations um, for the entire sector. Uh, and the 2004 Act created uh, a number of areas. One of them was um, the creation of the Building Consent Authority, the virtual entity within the council which is responsible for the issuing the consents, the inspections and the approval process. It also looked at um, increase uh, or in introducing licensed building practitioners. For the first time in New Zealand we had um, a way of looking at individuals, uh, engineers, uh, designers, builders, constructors and, uh, and recognising them for the skills and competencies. The challenge was that um, the initial time that they put forward those, those options uh, were arguably good quality recommendations, mm -hmm. um, but the sector wasn't ready for it. Uh, and one of the recommendations in the latest proposal is to bring back um, uh, an option called a fit and proper person, which is a test uh, about the individuals who enter the sector. It was originally proposed in the 2004 Building Act, but was removed. Um, due to the fact that they, they didn't believe that the sector was right for that type of um, assessment. So the two aspects which they're adding back into this one are uh, the fit and proper person test and also a code of ethics for licensed building practitioners, both of which were proposed in 2004 and both were removed as a result of sector consultation. So it is ramping it up. It's, it's just sad it's just taken such a long time to get to that particular point. Thank you. Uh, just, Deputy... uh, just further to that, I've, I've actually got a copy of it if you would like it. I'll, I'll give it to you and I think you find it Thank quite Thank you. That would, be, uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thanks. To Andrew and the team, thanks for the clarity of your pen. And when you're actually formulating this extra submission to government, it's think sharper, more pointed, and it's quite tough. Because as you say, Andrew, it's been a long time coming and it's been troublesome to get there. And given the fact that MB actually excluded a risk component in its initial consultation, and it wasn't until Jenny Salisa said to us in a meeting that nothing was excluded and, and go for everything, that we could actually get that included. 
So when you take the account what Council Newman mentioned about shelf companies disappearing after the conclusion of the build or the development, uh, Council left standing where you have had a, a, a payments to date and, and provisioning of $600 million out there, um, which would be way more than any other Council. But, so why is MB so um, adverse to investigating and having good clear optics on the risk component of this part of the construction industry? Um, uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm probably not the right person to ask that question to, um, having been involved in the um, Department of Building Housing and Ministry for a number of years. Um, one could speculate that um, it's a bit too hard, uh, and that's, you know, that's a probably a fair slash unfair comment to make. Uh, it is a challenging environment that they have to move in, um, and uh, it's a dynamic environment. Uh, the level of complexity for the construction sector, is, as you all yourselves have seen over the last few years, has increased exponentially, even in the last decade. Um, and so MB are, are struggling with that, uh, as we are as a council. Uh, the, the typical type of building that's been constructed when the 2004 Building Act was put in place was a single dwelling standalone house. Uh, now the, the typical dwelling is multi-storey, multi-unit, multi-complex. Uh, we receive, and back in those days, a, a consent was a single house, a single unit. Now we're receiving through our um, consenting authority a single consent which had up to 90 units on it. And yet that still needs to be uh, serviced within 20 working days. Uh, it's an incredibly challenging and complex environment um, so we want to change that, we want to make it fairer, we want to make it uh, more effective in the way that we operate, uh, but it needs to be on both sides. So this is not just about a consenting authority being more rigid or less rigid, depending on how you want to look at it. It is, as you've mentioned earlier in a previous um, uh, submission, a consultation. It is a collaboration between ourselves and the sector. Uh, a lot of the things that we are doing and the program I'm currently running is about that cooperation and, and ensuring that the industry, the designers, the builders, constructors, participate with us. If you want to make the walker go any faster, you can't do it alone. It has to be done with them in partnership. So um, government departments um, need that cooperation. They need us as BCAs and need the sector to provide them with absolutely um, accurate information for them to make those changes. Um, and so exactly what we're doing. We are not shy about sending back to them the information that they need to make to these, make these changes. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker to finish. So is, um, is there anything in scope about um, expanding the, the minimum um, size um, around exempt structures? Right now it's 10 square metres. Um, because I know the government wants to, um, I think, have more housing and the notion of tiny homes and the like is fairly prevalent. Is that in scope or not? Um, thank you, Councillor. Not specifically. Um, what they are addressing or have proposing is what they call modern methods of manufacturing, which is modular housing, offshore manufacturing. Uh, again, in, in principle, we 100% we agree with that. Uh, it is the, a quick and fast way of, of developing and implementing uh, large-scale developments efficiently, effectively, and you only look at around the world, Germany, um, where they do that very efficiently. Uh, what is lacking is the detail. What do they mean by modern methods of manufacturing? And given the fact that uh, we have been building in pre-manufactured pre houses for the last 40 years, I'm not quite sure when modern actually becomes modern, um, because Keith A. Holmes have been doing this for very successfully for a long period of time. So yes, um, we... we um, want to be involved in that process, but we want further detail. And, and uh, this is where the questions back to, to MB are, what do you mean by this? And we are not the only ones asking those questions. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Still on questions or so comments? This is, this is, this is a bit a of question, both. so we we'll oh, move questions. on. questions. No, it's not a question. OK, well, well let's move to uh, comment, and we'll start with Councillor Cooper. Thank you. And I just, for me, very pleased to see that we're being very strong on the liability. Because when we hear it's council paying, it's ratepayers paying. So uh, that for me is really critical, and it is disappointing to hear preliminary comments that you know government aren't really interested in that. Um, because for me, that's what makes us cautious. 
when we're doing our building consents. <coughs> and when we're criticised by government and everybody else for being too slow, it's around being cautious because we take all the liability. And so we have to be cautious on behalf of our ratepayers. And so it is a vicious circle that we can't get out of unless there is intervention and spread of liability. So I think that's really important. Um, and the other one is the producer statements. Um, I mean, our council spent a lot of time basically having to try and assess products, which is not really our job. Um, and I think that if there is a body that does that, the public can have confidence and we can get on with our real job um, of actually processing building consent. So I think for me those are two of the really critical issues and it has been very well articulated and um, expressed here. So um, we can only hope, um, but I hope we get more than just the hope, we actually get some action. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Darby. I, I do acknowledge some really good work that's gone into this submission and the contribution that we do make as a, a serious player to um, ultimately government decisions. And uh, this is a really well-researched paper, so I, I just appreciate uh, what you put into it. Thank you. Uh, look, I do want to just dwell, and Councillor Casey um, mentioned uh, the part about universal design. Uh, this stems um, from some work that... Um, um, Planning Committee Chair, Deputy Chair, and Chair and Deputy Chair of Environment and Community, and particularly Councillor Bartley has led, uh, being our um, liaison officer with the Disability Advisory Panel. Um, there are some one in 10 Aucklanders who suffer from a, a mobility and impairment. Um, and uh, the design of residential construction at the moment uh, disadvantages one in 10 Aucklanders. One in 10 Aucklanders uh, do not have the opportunity to live in homes that most Aucklanders have the opportunity to live in. Um, and we are going to see more people with uh, disabilities as our, our population ages. Um, and the living environments that we are creating today are unsuited to those people. So we, we focus a lot on the success of 13,000 plus uh, dwelling consents being granted in the previous 12 months. That's fantastic. Uh, but there's a big gap in that number as well. We're only designing uh, for a part of the population. Uh, so this harks back to something that uh, this council lost through the IHP process. Uh, we submitted in our draft plan, the unitary plan, uh, for universal access pr design provisions. We lost that. It was struck out. And when we regrouped, we just probably didn't have the appetite because of time to, to go back and have a look. Uh, but we've discussed that recently, uh, Chair of Environment and Community Committee, myself and Councillor Bartley and others, and we think it is time to go and have another look at this. But the closer we looked at it, we thought, this is not an Auckland problem, this is a national problem. And so we are approaching it as it is a national problem, so we wrote to the Minister of Building and Construction, and the reply came back from the Minister saying, I've spoken to two other Ministers, uh, our request was to meet with the one Minister, and we had a reply saying three ministers wanted to meet us, which is outstanding. And we met with the ministers and we had an extremely positive meeting. So what I'm arriving at, members, is that this part of the submission is in response to some work that we've been doing, but it's also in response to the willingness of the ministers to listen who invited us to make this submission. Um, so... It's happened rather quickly. Uh, Elise Copeland, you're the principal uh, specialist in universal access in the Auckland Design Office. I thank you for your work. Uh, we've, we've moved proactively uh, and collaboratively with uh, three government ministers to make the submission point. And uh, thank you. Hopefully, out of this, there is a national directive rather than uh, a requirement of this council to go through a very expensive, long, appealable plan change of its own. I'll take my hats off. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'll make the concluding comments in the discussion. <clears throat> um, first of all, thank you, Andrew. Um, I think your presentation today has indicated to us that you've got your head around it, and it was a very clear presentation, as uh, Councillor Casey said. Um, I think in terms of the nature of the submission, um, we need to say that we welcome the progress that's been made, uh, but it doesn't go far enough and it doesn't go fast enough. 
Uh, this has been around for, for six or seven years, and unless we put pressure on it for it to deliver, it'll be around for another long period of time. Um, you know, I know timelines have been set, but they've also said somewhere in the submission that maybe it's, you know, two to six years out. Well, two to six years out is no good. Um, <clears throat> we're building medium and high density now, uh, multi-unit dwellings now. We need a fit-for-purpose building code and act now. And, you know, the discussions have gone on long enough. Uh, we need to move on it. Uh, it needs to be have a clear time frame, and it needs to um, be more specific in what it asks. But there are critical things that I think we have to push for. The first is liability, and everybody knows that we've spent $600 million uh, in um, the weather tightness area uh, cleaning up mistakes that the industry has made. And unless we've got a proportionate liability, we still let those people off the hook. Unless we deal something about sh with shelf companies that can opt out and disappear, we let them off the hook. And I think Auckland ratepayers have had a gutsful about paying for the poor workmanship and design and building of private sector companies that are there to make a quick profit. So we need to really press hard on the proportionate liability, and if we can't get that, the fallback is the 20% cap, which the court basically says is a, an appropriate proportion in most of its, uh, its cases uh, for the council to meet. Um, how will we ever incentivise the private sector to do the job properly if they get off the hook and we, we carry the, the can for them? The second thing is the building and warrant, warranty and insurance scheme that's voluntary. It won't work. Even though it's the consumer that opts out, the, uh, the fly-by-nighter builder will put real pressure on the, con the consumer to say, uh, don't, don't take out the warranty, you don't need it, it'll add to the cost, etc. And the insurance company has told us very, cl very clearly uh, it's volume-driven. If they don't have the volume, they may not provide the product. Uh, the third thing is the National Product Register. We have what is it, Andrew? I think 60 building consent authorities around the country. And when a new product comes in, uh, it, it needs to be processed by each of those, those uh, authorities. That is just nonsensical. You want to do it once. You want to do it centrally. You want to have consistency across the country. Uh, and you want to do it by an agency that actually has the resources to do the job properly, do the testing, and find out. And, and I just cannot understand why this excludes the concept of a national product register and a central uh, bu building uh, product certifier. So I think those are the, the critical issues, um, but I certainly commend this paper uh, to the Council. So I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Carried. Um, councillors, what I want to do now, because I know a couple of councillors need to get away, is to just um, change the order of the agenda uh, with due respect to the Deputy Mayor's paper and the uh, with apologies to um, our, our submitters for the public submission process and move to items uh, C1 and 14. Uh, what I'm recommending to councillors is that if we're going to discuss the notice of motion, we need the briefing on where uh, the Civic Administration building sale is at. So um, I'm going to recommend that we take it in the order of C1 followed by uh, item 14 and that we discuss both in confidential, and that's the strongest legal advice that I've received um, from uh, our, our legal officers here. Uh, so I'm going to move that we, we do the uh, agenda in that order, C1 and 14, in confidential, and I want to move the motion that the public be excluded. Do I have a seconder for that? Seconded by Councillor Clough. Um, yeah. Yep, you're welcome to, Councillor. Yeah, Councillor Fletcher. for allowing me to speak, Your Worship. I think that the agenda that we have from the recommendations that we met in the inquiry that was held, there were recommendations about governance, and that too was a complex matter. That too, we found it difficult to get information.
specifically met, um, that may give elected members some comfort um, around the items uh, noted in the um, notice of motion. So, sorry, can I just get you to <clears throat> concisely tell councillors what your best advice is as to whether these items uh, must be held in confidential for them to get the meaningful information that we want? That's correct. Okay. So, I'm going... Sorry, um, Councillor, Councillor Watson. Yeah, um, I find this um, a, a little perplexing and, and a little um, disturbing. I can see why um, certain uh, parts of the council might like this to be held in confidential, but I, I, I see this as a, as, a, as a breach of standing orders. Um, Councillor Lee and myself have forwarded a notice of motion uh, we've followed the correct procedure here in terms of giving it to the CEO. It's been accepted. It has been uh, advertised in the public, part of the agenda. There has been no communication with the mover or seconder of the notice of motion no. prior to this announcement just now. Indeed, as Councillor Fletcher says, it's something of an ambush. Because if that conversation had taken place, you would have found that in both uh, my discussion and Councillor Lee's, um, we have no intention of disclosing anything confidential. In fact, the barely three quarter of a page report, because that's what we're talking about here, the confidential item, discounting the old agenda item that we've all got from 2016, barely amounts to three quarters of a page. So we have absolutely no intention of referring to that at all. And indeed, if we look at the agenda, the composition of the agenda, which is what we should be following, is we have the notice of motion in public, which does not contravene or um, make any reference to anything in the confidential section. And then we have in confidential C1, the sale and redevelopment and any matters that officers might choose to discuss. So this proposal to bundle it all into one is a breach of standing orders. It's been done for political purposes uh, and a matter of high public interest. The sale of the Civic Administration Building, the seat of Auckland City Council local government for the last half century. So there's absolutely no reason why we cannot take on board the legal advice quite correctly and have that in C1 and address the notice of motion advertised in the public section of the meeting where we are giving an undertaking. There's absolutely no reference to anything in the confidential and have the matters of public interest addressed in public. So my... Uh, question to the standing orders is how proper is it to, without any consultation or discussion, to unilaterally move a matter that's in public into confidential when there is no justification for that? Because that's the situation we're being, uh, being confronted with at the moment. Thank you, Councillor. Just to clarify the point, I'm not suggesting it be bundled into one. The items will be taken separately, and I think you'd agree that the sequence is you get the report first, and there's much more in the report than simply on the paper, as I understand it, because until you've got the report, how can you make sense of the notice of motion? But the legal advice to me is if you want in the notice of motion to talk about the full commercial details, we can do that now but they need to be in confidential. I don't think anybody challenges that. No ambush here. Um, I want you to have all of the information that is available, but because that information is, is commercially sensitive about an agreement that I'm informed is impending, you can't have that in the public arena. It doesn't make sense to have it in the public arena. So what is going to be in the public arena then? Because we're giving an undertaking here that there's nothing that we're discussing that well, is, is, is a breach of confidence. Let, so let you me, can't, can't let, have it both ways, Mr Mayor. Let, let me suggest this, <clears throat> that we deal with C1 as it is set out in confidential, and I don't think you have any objection to that. 
Um, and then within C1, you'll be given some very clear legal advice. And we listen to that, and then we make the decision about the notice of motion. But that, that, that seems to me to make sense. Is there any objection around the table to that? Sorry, sorry can we, can we yeah. just, be, just be clear about what you're proposing here? So <clears throat> fine, we, we discuss C1 and confidential. Then the decision about having the notice of motion in, in public. Will be made at that point, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. The, the, the notice of motion, and this is my whole point, has already been accepted in the public yeah, agenda. Yeah, and, and, and I accept that, and it's going to be handled separately. But I think C1 is under confidential now, and for very clear reasons. And the reasons will be set out when we discuss C1 uh, as to why the parameters of what can be said in public session. And, and, the, and it will give advice on the notice of motion as well. So I'm going to suggest, it doesn't require a motion because C1 is already under confidential, that we move into C1, that we deal with item 14 after C1, and we will make a decision having heard all of the advice we get under C1 about whether the uh, item 14 can be dealt with publicly or in confidential. I think that would probably address the concerns that I've heard, heard raised here. Uh, okay, is, is there, a, sorry, is there, a, is there any objection to what I'm proposing here? Because we can discuss that objection. Okay, Councillor Lee. Thank, thank you, Mr Mayor. Normally it's a good process, if not courtesy, to discuss this with the mover. Um, I uh, think that there is a misunderstanding of the nature of this notice of motion. This notice of motion is a motion of stating a principle here um, without getting into details of uh, confidential commercial arrangements, whether they're, they're smart commercial arrangements or otherwise. Um, this is a matter of principle that the because of the importance the iconic importance of this building, and because of the extremely unusual nature of the deal, and I would um, respectfully disagree with our, uh, our legal ad advisor here today when um, he stated that this is, has no similarity whatsoever with Norska. What is similar is the highly unusual nature of the arrangement between a local body and a private developer. And the Norsco arrangements were so unusual, so unconventional, that they kept the Auditor General busy for a couple of years. As you said, a very complex report. I, I, I wouldn't like to see this go the same way. However, it could well do. And I think that we need to settle the matter of principle first, which doesn't require um, confidential or embarrassing, might I say, details, just stating the principles of whether we agree with the notice of motion, which is on the agenda, or we do not agree with the notice of motion. I believe um, I'd prefer that we dealt with this first. However, um, this notice of motion must be dealt with in public, in my view. That is the appropriate process for such notices of motion. I recall being involved in a notice of motion regarding the sale of the ports of Auckland. You couldn't get more commercially sensitive and complex than that. However, that debate was held in public. And so I would ask that the notice of motion be treated with due respect um, by due process and debated in public so that the people of Auckland can see what their representatives are doing and what they believe and where they stand, including the Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other comments uh, on this? Councillor Walker. Sure. Uh, my concern is around um, process. So the Mayor is suggesting effectively that the confidential item is put forward first, and I'm assuming that it's being suggested that there's a decision around the content of that um, item. And what would concern me is that once that decision is made, 
uh, the notice of motion is, is somewhat redundant because we've actually made the decision and I'd suggest that um, the Mayor is aware of that. There's another way of dealing with this issue and that may be to go into confidential and deal with matters of information that need to be heard in confidential and then we adjourn the item, that's the confidential item, and we deal with the notice of motion. And then after that we come back. And that process would allow a maximum amount of information to be conducted in public. And that concerns me. This particular building and site is part of property acquisitions that were acquired by Auckland City over well over a century, well over a hundred years, to put in place a fabric that could last for the civic role of this city, which continues to go on. And my concern is not simply around the building, but around the significant area of land that was acquired for that purpose. And I would suggest that there is huge public interest in this issue and that a maximum should be conducted in public. Can I just point out that item C1 doesn't involve a decision, it's simply noting it's providing the information that I think is important in terms of the decision that this council makes on the notice of motion. That's why it needs to come first. And I don't think anybody's disagreed with that that I've heard around the table. So I want to, then we will come back. We need to do item C1 in uh, public excluded. It's, that's where it sits on the agenda. <clears throat> Having had that discussion and heard that information and probably heard some information on the legal aspects of the implications of the notice of motion, then we will be in a position to make a judgment on the notice of motion. But it needs to be done in that order. I think that's pretty straightforward. That's where I intend to go Point unless order. anybody has something really pressing order. that they would like to say before we, we proceed on that basis. Uh, Councillor Cooper. So I've just raised a oh. point of order. I'm sorry, point of order. So point of order, councillor. My again goes to um, process, and without disclosing it, the recommendations of the confidential item do specify decisions, the decisions. So my concern is that. Point of order. Sorry, I need to. Is that what is the point of order? I, this is a ramble. The. Councillor, can you come order. to the point of order? I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for it. The point it. of order is around the veracity of the information that the Mayor is communicating. I would suggest that well, the that, I'm sorry, confidential that's, item that's, does go to decisions. I'm, I'm ruling that out of order. That's just unfounded and, uh, and unsupportable. Uh, Councillor Cooper, just you had the call. Um, just my comment is I would like us to go into confidential so we can actually discuss the item. I mean, for me having to deal with a, with a notice of motion without having all the information, background information to make any call on the notice of motion seems absurd. I don't want to be making any decision on the notice of motion in a vacuum. So for me, I just want us to get on with it, receive the information in this document and be able to ask the questions and then we can look at going into the notice of motion. But we're just wasting our time yep. here. And, and I do take exception when people say, oh, this is all about politics, well, everything around this table is about politics. Whichever side you're on, that's what's going on here. Thank you. OK, I haven't oh, seen... Sorry, point of order. And I just point, want point, point of order. And, Councillor and, Watson. And speaking to Standing Orders 2.5.1 uh, notices of motion, um, our notice of motion has been accepted by the Chief Executive and it has been put onto the agenda. What I'm hearing from you is that uh, we will go into confidential, we will discuss uh, a three-quarter page uh, information there, uh, and then there will be some sort of vote taken on whether we then go into, uh, then go proceed to item 14, the notice of motion. What I'm, is, is that correct? No, no, Councillor, you're quite wrong. I've said that the items will be dealt with separately, but sequentially you should have the report okay. under C1 first of all. 
<clears throat> then we move to uh, item 14, and a decision can be made at that point as to whether that can be discussed confidentially or in open. Uh, and if it is done in the open, then there will just need to be very careful dealing with the motion so that it does not infringe on the commercial sensitivity around this issue that it will be obvious to you, is obvious to you now, having read C1. Okay? So that is, that is the nature of my <coughs> point of order. Yep. You refer to, it, to a decision being made. Clearly, council is going to receive instruction as yep. to it's what they can't speak about. You, you, your words there of decision infer that the council is going to make a decision whether to hear the notice of motion. No. My no, no, sorry, councillor, sorry to interrupt, but I, let me say it once again, the two items will be dealt with separately. The question that we'd need to decide before we get to item 14 is whether it makes sense to deal with that in confidence, in which case what we could say would be more limited, or whether it should be done in the open. But all I'm talking about is the sequence at the moment, and the sequence obviously makes sense that we get the briefing that you, you've asked for actually in the notice of motion, uh, and that will deal both with the questions of heritage and it will deal with where the agreement is at and what our powers as a council actually are to, to um, intervene in the way that the, uh, the notice of motion suggests. Because I want you to hear legal advice on that, before you take a step that I'm advised would be unlawful. Okay? That's pretty clear. Um, we have got a, we've got a speaking list here, but all I'm asking at this stage is that sequentially we deal with C1 so that we can have all of that information on the table. I don't think we need to debate around that, or do we? Okay, sorry, you, you, you want to take the call? Councillor Simpson. Well, that's what you're asking. You, you're talking too much here. You're getting, you're getting, talking more than you need to. All you're asking is that C1 be as an agenda change. C1 is addressed before item 14. It's as simple as that. Don't talk about anything else. Just decide that. And actually, that's a very sensible thing to do. And I would be supporting that. Thank you. That's right. I thought I made that clear. Okay. Um, point of order. Point, point of order. <laughs> Councillor Clo. It's my understanding under uh, whether. I just want a ruling, are you breaching standing orders, which I don't believe you are, <clears throat> by deciding as chair to change the order, the agenda order. You can give pre pre precedence to any business after the confirmation of minutes, so it's within your powers is my understanding. I'd like a ruling on that. No, um, I can answer that very clearly under standing order 2.4.2. .2. I, as the chair, have the ability to determine the order of the agenda. Thank you. We'll okay. Just, so, look, I, I, do it. I'm, I'm, I'm with Councillor Simpson. We're going to drag this debate on unnecessarily because we're talking about sequencing, which I understand uh, from uh, Councillor Watson. He's happy with that sequence, and I haven't seen anybody that objects to that sequence. So, sorry, Councillor Collins, is this a point of order? No. It's a question to the lawyer. Okay. Yep, 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 please proceed. My question is, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the sequence that you're proposing, Mr. Mayor, to the legal advisor. Am I, can I expect, if when we come out of uh, confidence, to get a legal opinion from yourself saying that we shouldn't be discussing item 14 in public? Yes, when, when we come to item 14 after having heard the confidential uh, item, yes, we can talk to the uh, scope you have to discuss those matters in public. But so we'll do that at item 14. So to clarify, yep. there's no, like, you haven't got uh, an opinion that you've been asked for previous to the question I've just asked you that sets out we're going to get more information that's going to be new to us at item 14, suggesting we don't look at it. Because I'm trying to find a respectful place for the item that the notice of motion has put up. Because just, you know what I mean? So we can get past yep. the baggage. Yeah. I, item 14 will be dealt with on the agenda. I, I've accepted it on the agenda, um, but un, unless the mover or the seconder decides otherwise, um, what, we'll be, what we'll be getting advice on before we do that is what it, what it would be appropriate to say and not to say, uh, and 
what the legal consequences of passing the notice of motion would be. And I think we all need that. OK, look, I'm proposing now that we move straight to item C1, and I'll move the motion that for the discussion of item C1, uh, that the public be excluded for the reasons set out in the report, which is the commercial sensitivity of the matter that we are discussing. Uh, have I got a seconder for that? Uh, I've got a seconder, Councillor Coe. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Carried.